I am a big fan of Kent Beck's work. He basically invented test-driven development. He was one of the authors of JUnits, and he also came up with extreme programming. I've met Kent a few times, but I was really pleased because he got in touch with me recently. Kent had seen one of my videos about approval testing. Kent Beck invented the Test Desiderata, which is a thinking tool for evaluating tests. And he asked me, how would you apply these criteria to my tests? He wants to understand them better. So this is the challenge then. How do approval tests measure up against Kent Beck's Test Desiderata? This video is the first part of my answer to that challenge. Hi, I'm Emily Bates. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please take a look around, especially at my previous videos about approval testing. And if you like what you see, please subscribe and like this video. And if you want to support my work with Code Carters and this channel, you can do that via Patreon. Kent Beck invented the Test Desiderata model in 2019. He noticed that people were designing tests badly, and they seemed to take it for granted that that was just how tests were. So the desiderata was a way to help people write better tests. You can say, well, look here, your tests should have these properties. And if yours don't, then you're missing something. I first met Kent in 2002 at a conference in Italy. I was there with my husband, Jeff, who was talking about this new style of testing that he was doing that we later named approval testing. Kent at the time was skeptical. And I can totally understand that. We were very young and pretty terrible at explaining things. On a personal level though, Kent was friendly and supportive, as he still is now. Although he's still clearly skeptical about approval testing, hence this challenge. So can I explain the approach better now using Kent Beck's test desiderata? So this is the picture of the 12 desiderata. And in this video, I want to focus on the ones that are different between ordinary unit tests and unit tests that use approval testing. I think the main difference is in readability, and I've got an example to demonstrate that. I found this article by Torsten Mandry and Jacek Bilski called Anatomy of a Good Test, which references Kent's desiderata and illustrates them with an example in Java. There's a link to it in the show notes, so do go and read it. It's worth your time. I'm basing this demo on their example code. In their article, Torsten Mandry and Jacek Bilski start with this test case that works, but honestly isn't very readable, and they transform it in three steps to something that's really quite nice. So this is the first example. It's really kind of long, it's just a wall of text. There's lots of mocks and verifies and assertions, and it's all kind of a bit jumbled. So the first thing they do is actually just restructure it, put in some white space and a couple of comments. It's the same code, but it's immediately more readable because you can tell what all the different parts of it are. In the second step, they do some additional transformation to hide irrelevant details. So this makes the test much shorter. Um, the arrange step is using some um, helper methods to set up the various things you need for the test. And the assertions are just plain assertions. They've removed all of the verify calls for the mocks. So it turned the mocks effectively into stubs. And then in step three, they, they do a lot more work transforming the code to make it more of a specification and less of a test case. So using ideas inspired by behavior-driven development. They've got a lot of use of fluent interfaces to set up the articles and the shopping cart. And again, lots of fluent interfaces in the assertions. These tests all run pretty quickly. I can run all of these tests in under two seconds. And I should say, actually, I've shown you four test cases, but I've actually got seven here because I've taken a copy of each of the three steps, thinking to transform it to use approvals. Um, and today in this demo, I'm just going to look at one of those. But uh, I just wanted to show you running all the tests. So I kind of looked at this and I thought, well, I could have transformed any of these three to use approvals, but I'm going to work with the one at the end of step two, because I felt that step three with all those fluent interfaces 
didn't really look like tests I'd, I'd seen with the teams I'd been coaching. I mean, it looked very nice, but step two looked much more like what I would have found when I was coaching a team. So I just took a copy of it. There was just showing you the diff to show that it's actually the same code. Um, and then I'm going to transform it to use approvals. So in this case, I'm going to just delete all of those assertions. I'm going to replace them with a call to approvals.verify. And I need to pass that an argument as a thing I want to verify, which is a print out of the shopping cart. And the shopping cart is the um, system under test here, the, the thing that the object that has state and all of those assertions, we're checking the state of this object. So let me just show you the printer that I've written in the print step. So um, this is a piece of code that's actually using one of the very new features in Java, uh, string templates and multi-line strings. And it's just taking that shopping cart and um, transforming it to a string that displays all the little articles that are in the cart and uh, the subtotal, the shipping cost, the total. So this piece of code is actually very neat. And it's not particularly longer than all the assertions that I had before. When I run this test, um, of course, it fails. It's the first time I ran it and it's an approval test and it's got nothing to compare against. So what it does now is it brings up this window showing me this is what I received and um, there's nothing in the approved file. So what do you want to do? So you can see the printout of the shopping cart at the end of the test. We've got two articles, different prices and quantities, and it's calculated the subtotal, the shipping and the total. And looking at those numbers, they actually look fine. So I'm going to approve that. So now the approved file contains the expected text. And if I run the test again, this time it passes. If you can see, it's still taking about two seconds to run all these tests. So as I mentioned before, approval tests aren't particularly slower than ordinary unit tests, even though they are accessing the file system. So let's just review the difference between the original test and the new test with approvals. All of those assertions have been replaced with a call to approvals.verify and my printer. Okay, so at this point, I've just kind of done a little bit of changes behind the scenes. I wanted to just focus on these two tests. So I've put a dis disabled marking on all of the other tests. So now I've only got these two tests, the original test in step two and my version of it that uses approvals. And they're both passing. So the thing with readability is that you can only find out so much from just reading the code. Um, what's more interesting, I think, is how readable is the test when it fails? How easy is it to discover what actually the problem is? So I've gone to my system under test here, the shopping cart, and I've looked at this method, which is the one I'm trying to test. And I've just written in comments here several bugs and I want to see how the tests react when I introduce each of these bugs. So the first bug here is if I reset the available units of the product um, so that there aren't enough of it. So now when I run the test, both of my tests fail, both the approvals version and the original. So we can compare the error messages. So actually, both of them have failed with this exception. Um, it's being thrown in the act step of the test. And since the act step of both tests is the same, both tests have failed in exactly the same way. They both point you have a stack trace pointing straight at the line of code in the test and the production code where the error occurred. So actually, they're just as readable as each other. OK, let's try a different bug. What if we use the wrong customer status to calculate the price of the item? Well, actually, neither of the tests react to this. Um, so this is a thing with the, the price calculator here is being stubbed in the test. And it doesn't actually check. This is the stub, and that's the check that's supposed to to um, be sensitive to which customer status we send in, and we've set it up to not react to any, it'll take any customer status. This part might need a little more explanation. 
The shopping cart has a dependency on the price calculator, which we stubbed. And the bug is that the cart is no longer passing the correct arguments to the price calculator, but neither test is failing. Now, I'm not saying here that we shouldn't have stubbed the price calculator. I think that's a perfectly reasonable way to design a unit test. We're focusing on the shopping cart unit, and the price calculator unit is potentially being tested in a different unit test. What we've got here is a kind of integration bug, because each unit works fine by itself, but when you put them together, the shopping cart isn't quite sending the right message to the price calculator. One of Kent's desiderata is predictive, and this is the main one that unit tests don't do well at, because lots of green unit tests doesn't predict everything will necessarily work in production. Unit tests don't find integration errors, and that's why you need other kinds of tests too. So simply using approvals in place of assertions doesn't turn your unit test into an integration test. Okay, so what about this bug? What if we actually just plain set it to use the wrong price for items? Okay, so both tests have failed here and the approval test has popped up this window to say, look, it didn't match what I was expecting. The, um, the text on the left is what I received. The price was one, three and stuff. And what I was expecting on the right was that, you know, these much more realistic prices. So this test has very clearly shown that there's a problem with the price of the items and that affects the subtitle, total and the, and the total. I think that's pretty readable. The original test then, um, it also fails and it's saying, okay, there's a difference in the price. I expected a value of 9.95 and I got one. And because this test has lots of assert, assert statements and the test has failed on this, like the third assert statement, we actually have no idea about what happened with the other assert assertions in this test. So the design of this test case doesn't really give us the full picture. I think the approval test has actually given us a much better idea of what's wrong, much better overview of what's happening, the context for this problem. Okay, so just one more bug here. Let's try adding the item twice to the shopping cart. Okay, so again, the approval test has failed and it's popped up this window. And we can see on the left very clearly, we've got two additional items in the shopping cart and the subtotal and the total are now completely wrong. So I think this also gives you a very clear understanding of what the bug is. We've got too many articles being added. And again, the original test here with all these assertions, it's failing on the first assertion now. We've, we expected two items in the basket, we've got four. So it does find the bug and it does tell you what the problem is. But to be honest, I think it just doesn't give you as much context. If I received this failure, my instinct would probably be to put a breakpoint here in the test and run it again and inspect the objects, which is effectively what the approval test kind of just did for me. It, it showed me what, what the state of the objects is. So all in all, I'm feeling quite good about the readability of these approval tests compared with the original test just using normal assertions. When a test fails, the readability becomes very important because you need to understand why it failed. This is the main area where I think approval tests really shine. But I also think there's a writability bonus the code for a printer is not particularly more complex or lengthy than the equivalent assertions. Most of the other desiderata are fairly equivalent. Both are equally predictive and fast. I do perhaps have more to say about how composable and behaviorally sensitive approval tests are. But for that, I'd need a demo with more than one test case. And I plan to cover that in a future video. So until then, I hope you and Kent understand a little better how approval tests measure up against the test desiderata.